Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to men, to all men. The Lord is at hand. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now, as I told you before, today is Gaudete Sunday. Rejoice Sunday. Light the rose candle. <laughs> but what do you have to rejoice about? Is there joy in your life? And what is your source of joy? Or even better yet, what is joy anyway? I think that joy is one of those enigmatic emotions. It's the kind that you seek after, but yet you never quite find it. You long for joy, and yet it never seems to quite come. The reason for joy in Advent and joy in Christmas, the reason why it's so hard to find and to experience, again, I think is because you don't know what it is. Most people think that when the Lord says rejoice, he means be exceedingly happy, <laughs> especially at Christmas. You probably think of the child and all the nostalgia of Christmas tide and the joy on the child's face probably for the presents. If the pleasures of life bring you happiness, then you think that if you have more and more of those things like you did as a child, then that will bring you joy. But I don't think the dictionaries have it right. Joy is not exceeding happiness. Joy is not simply great pleasure. And that's the reason why it's so hard for us, even at Christmas time, to find joy. Think of Charlie Brown in the famous special. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? You see, Charlie Brown was trying to find joy everywhere but the one source where it is found. True joy cannot be found by looking at your lives. True joy cannot be found with all the seasonal rituals and pageantry, all your family traditions. True joy isn't even found in genuine acts of love and mercy. Joy only comes in Christ. Linus got it right when his response to Charlie Brown's despair was simply, well, his hopelessness too, was simply to proclaim to him the birth of Christ, according to St. Luke. <laughs> By the way, the author of Charlie Brown, he had to fight to include that in the TV special. True joy finds its source in Christ. That is, in his redemption and the promise and hope of the resurrection and eternal life. You who are bound still in your sins, you who are bound captive to the law, you are those who can't find joy. For being bound to the law, there is, there is only hopelessness and no future. You who still fear hell and death, you might be able to find some basic happiness in the pleasures of this life, but you'll admit that you can never find true joy. This is true for all of us. You who look to your own lives, to yourselves, your pursuits, your gains, you seek joy, and you never quite find it. So you might wonder, if today is called Gaudata, and then, again, that means rejoice, if that's today's Sunday, then why did the church appoint for us today's gospel? John the baptizer in prison. Look at the cover of your service folder. John and his disciples, too, are trying to find joy in the midst of their struggles and sorrows. John lay in prison bound by the law of Herod. His ministry was rapidly coming to an end, if it wasn't over already. His disciples are despairing, not knowing what tomorrow will bring. They're looking for joy. So John sent word by his disciples to Jesus and said to him, 
Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? John does not want his disciples now in their hopelessness to look to him for joy. John does not want them to look at their own lives as a source of true and abiding joy. John knows that everything we have, everything that we are, will become dust. Moth and rust will destroy all the living until the second coming. In the end, everything will be consumed by fire. Therefore, John's proclamation is, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. John does not point to himself, and he doesn't point his disciples back at themselves, but he points them to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ. In the midst of his suffering and his imprisonment, as he faces death, John's confidence, his hope, and his source of every joy is in Jesus. Yes, John's disciples want to hold on to the baptizer, but he wants them to know that Jesus is the one they should cling to. Their trust needs to be in him and him alone. And so what John does is a sort of handoff, a passing of the torch. He sends them to Jesus with that rhetorical question. And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus points John's disciples to all the signs that he is the Messiah, to his word and to his works. He points them to the word they know so well from the Psalms and the prophets of old. They recall that Isaiah promised sight to the blind. They know the word of the prophet that said the lame would walk again. They remember Elisha being or healing Naaman the leper. They remember the prophets, Elijah and Elisha, raising the dead. And now they see in Jesus greater works even than these. Those who are not looking, nor could not find their Messiah, are given by the baptizer, by this prophet, eyes to behold the word of God. That is, the Son of God. Those who do not know the way of salvation are now given the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus. Those whose bodies were infected by sin and death are cleansed by him and promised Resurrection and life everlasting. Even deaf ears are unstopped to hear the good news. All those who have been wandering and walking through the valley of the shadow of death are raised up by Jesus' word of forgiveness and with it new life. And all the poor in spirit are given a rich treasure in the good news that is preached to them. Jesus, who comes to save his people from their sins. Now that is the source of real joy, and joy really beyond any comparison to the things of this world. Your every hope for the future is given to you in Jesus Christ. But then Jesus continued in the gospel, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me, now, wait a minute. He sends, or he sends these disciples of John with this great message. Look, all the signs of the Messiah have come. But then he says, this is also a source of offense. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. How could anyone be offended by such great good news, joy-bringing news? Well, it's not so hard as you might think. The disciples, even with this good news, the disciples of John, probably wondered, maybe a little or a lot, whether Jesus was crazy. Is he truly God's prophet? All the things that you point us to, how does that deal with their teacher's situation? Right then and there, the way that he suffered languishing in prison. Prisons 
full of heaped dead bodies. No attention. The door is locked and the key is thrown away. Only death will be his portion. It seems as if God has actually forsaken John the baptizer as he lays in misery agony. But John would have us believe that his joy is being made perfect in his weakness. Joy is being made perfect in weakness. He knew the word of God. You remember what the psalmist writes, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. To use the language of the apostle, John is being made to be like Christ. With every affliction comes joy and hope. John was not offended by Jesus nor by his own personal suffering because he knew that he must die with Christ to live with him. John lived not by sight, not by experience, but by faith of what is to come, the promise of the Messiah. This is how the Lord works. This is how his scriptures give encouragement for joy. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, says St. James. Count it as joy when you meet trials? Hmm. Or St. Peter, rejoice in sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Or the writer to the Hebrews, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus gives joy, not so much in the midst of things that you would think would bring you joy, but actually in the midst of difficulty and of suffering, and even as you face death. Because in the midst of those things, he points you to himself to his cross where he died for the sins of the world, indeed for your sins. And with that death, then, you have the promise, the promise of the resurrection of the body, that is, the full and complete healing of your flesh and also life eternal, salvation. The only source of true and abiding joy is present in Jesus Christ as you look forward to the future glory that will be revealed in him. Jesus today is giving you, even though, a brief picture, a little bit of heaven even today. As he advents to you, he reveals himself to you for your joy. Even as he comes today, though, to redeem you, to save you. That's really what the worship of the church is all about. As you go about this life, hopeless, despairing, suffering and pain, misery, facing death even, looking for joy but in the midst of things that you would think would never bring you joy. There you meet Christ and his death, his suffering, his pain for you. He brings you joy in the midst of things hoped for and with the conviction of things not yet seen. That is to say, joy is given to you today under weakness, hidden under means, that is, under water, a word proclaimed, good news, in his body and his blood. And in all these things you have the promise, the hope, the resurrection, that he will co finally come and rescue you from this veil of tears. You know this to be true. You have your every confidence, just in the same way as Jesus said, to John's disciples. See, go and tell John what you hear and see. And so on the last day, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. His promise is that death will be no more, and there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain anymore. On that day, there will be true joy, for the former things will have passed away. And even today, we get a little taste of that here in his service.
So rejoice. Gaudita. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, your Lord. Amen.